Hello students and welcome back to another Lore of the Iron Kingdoms with me, Professor Caster. Today we are continuing our Warcasters of the Protectorate of Meenath. We're going to start off super hot with Fiora, Priestess of the Flame, and then we're going to go through all of her variations and her eventual downfall that only made her meaner and, well, more flaming than she was before. And then we are going to cool it off a little bit with Krios and all of his variations as well. But sit back, enjoy it. If you guys are enjoying this, please like, subscribe, comment, let us know how you're enjoying this. Let your friends and fellow gamers know so we can keep this steam train rolling. And as always, thank you, Private Your Press, for letting us read your fantastic lore. But without further ado, let's begin. Fiora, Priestess of the Flame, forged in the blessed fires of faith, Fiora is known for her iron will and blazing temper. An unfathomable vessel of wrathful power, she demonstrates the ferocity of battle that is without compare. She is a living example of the temple flame guard who attend her with absolute devotion. Fior was a child when she first manifested her affinity for and control over flames. Recognizing her ability as a gift directed by the hand of the creator, her prominent family quickly stifled any disparaging rumors that her powers might be sorceress in nature and therefore impure. They had long been associated with the temple flame guard and arranged for their young daughter to be tutored by the order's most influential and powerful clergy. Ultimately, Fiora entered the ranks of the Insidium, a specialized body of the priesthood dedicated to the temple flame guard. Due to her exceptional abilities, Fiora was chosen to receive both spiritual training and martial instruction. As Fiora's talent as a warcaster developed, several scrutators took particular interest in the powers powerful young woman who in time became a preeminent leader among the temple's martial defenders. When the standing priest of the flame passed on to his rewards in Urcane, Fiora was chosen to lead the flame guard. She prepared her temple for war since the day of her appointment and was instrumental in reshaping the orders into a true fighting force. She considers the nation of Signar to be both inherently flawed and a bastion of heretical Morrowind teachings. That such a government would ever claim authority over the Protectorate galled her, and she was glad to enter the Great Crusade when it was declared. Fiora holds her people to high standards of discipline she herself exemplifies. She is a capricious commander, but because her actions mirror her words, she is respected by her troops. As one might expect from such a driven and intense individual, Fiora prefers to lead from the front entering the fray with a zealot's righteousness and laying purifying flame upon the wicked with fists fueled by her warcaster armor. Powerful though she is, Fiora has one significant fault. Her ambition and intolerance of disobedience has made her so possessive of power that she trusts no one else and has long resented those of higher station. Her promotions through the flame guard ranks has seen her become increasingly distant as she cements her hold on the order. In truth, the Temple Flame Guard answers to her alone, and it may be only a matter of time before Fiora begins to believe herself the Protectorate's true leader. And that would be a problem because, well, I suppose in Protectorate stuff, people that uh, fall to that type of folly, unless the Harbinger says, hey, you're going to be the leader, um, I feel like that would cause some kind of, you know, civil war inside the Protectorate Church. And I imagine that's probably happened before. But yeah, with her type of flaming ambition, yeah, that could be a huge problem. But we'll see how that plays out, shall we? Uh, but let's go check out her Mark 3 to Mark 4 and see what's changed. And as always, we'll start with her stats, which have changed a little bit. Uh, she's still a speed 6, still a magic user of 6. And still has her control range of 12. However, her mat has gone up from a 6 to a 7 in Mark IV. And her rat has gone up from a 5 to a 6, making her a little bit better a melee combatant. Uh, her defense is still a 15, so crazy high defense. Her arm is still a 17, and she's still immune to fire. So that is fantastic for her. And then her abilities have changed slightly. So she still has her veteran leader, Flame Guard. So all Flame Guard within 10 inches of her gain plus 1 to their attack rolls. And the, what they gave her in her abilities is something called Whips, a Whip of the Flames. Models suffering fire continuous effect while in this model's control range suffer minus two to their attacks. So basically giving these guys a almost a melee concealment or actually that's a little bit better than concealment because uh, that works for both melee and range attacks. So, well, at least while they're in her control range. So 
that is awesome. Or terrifying, depending on if you're going up against her. And then, looks like her feet, Scorched Earth, has gotten better in Mark IV. Originally, Scorched Earth just caused all enemies in her control range to catch on fire. Uh, but now, it not only causes all of her enemies within her control range to catch on fire, uh, it also, all friendly warjacks can now charge enemies who are suffering from the fire continuous effect without spending focus. And that is a charge and powerful slam attack. So, yeah, that's just adding insult to injury. You're already on fire, now you're going to be hit by a warjack for free. Let's check out her weapons. Alrighty, well still, her weapons are basically the same. Uh, she still has two flamethrowers, both with continuous fire and in spray 8 pow 12 guns and then her truth and consequences are well it looks like they've been nerfed slight no no they haven't been nerfed slightly sorry misread they still have the critical fire effect and they are still a mat 7 and in mark 4 they're now a one inch reach instead of a half inch reach because everything's one inch reach now and they're still a pow 13 so a little bit better a little bit longer distance you can start swinging and with her uh, dual attack and having having a uh, gunfighter in Mark IV on her flamethrowers, uh, she can use those in melee now as well. So, yeah, she can catch a lot of things on fire very quickly and cause all sorts of chaos on the field, especially if her enemies do not have immunities to fire. But I imagine if you're going up against the Protectorate, why wouldn't you have immunities to fire, even though it's very rare to have immunities to fire and flame? Yeah. Well, let's see her spell list and see what's changed. And it appears all of her spells have changed. Although some of them are very similar to other spells that uh, work a little bit more conveniently. But yeah, it appears that uh, Blazing Effigy has been taken off. Dauntless Resolve has been taken off. Um, Engine of Destruction has been taken off. Hexhammer has been taken off. Ignite is now gone. And Wall of Fire is now gone. But let's see what replaces them. So she was given Avenging Force, um, cost two. It's a self-control, uh, upkeepable. Uh, if one or more friendly models, or one or more friendly faction warrior models, uh, were it were damaged by an enemy, enemy attack in the spellcaster's control range during your maintenance phase, you can move, or you can have a model in your battle group move up three inches and take a swing, and that's upkeepable, and that's everybody. So it basically gives. All of your guys avenging force, well, all the battle or war jacks avenging force, which would kind of be good if you had a lot of war jacks. Uh, then another spell they added to her was convection. So when convection destroys a living enemy model, you can give one focus point to a war jack in your battle group. Uh, then we have fire step, which is kind of like, kind of like the blazing effigy, uh, but with fire step. Enemy models currently within two of the spellcasters suffer a power 13 damage roll, and after the attack is resolved, place the spellcaster completely within two of their current locations, so you can jump her around. And but you can only use it once per activation. But a power 13 usually can do a lot of damage to a unit model type. Not as much to a warjack, but I don't know. Catching or you know lighting people up is kind of always nice. And then. Well, actually, it doesn't look like she lost Hexhammer. She still has Hexhammer, so sorry, just misreading that. Uh, when an enemy model declares it is casting a spell while in this model's control range, the enemy spellcaster immediately suffers at D3 points. If the enemy spellcaster is destroyed from this damage, the spell does not take effect, which is basically the same as the original Hex. And then we have, and then we have Insight. Insight is actually a neat spell. So what Insight does, it's 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 a very expensive spell, it costs four, so it's basic like a little mini feat. But friendly faction models gain plus two to attack and damage rolls against enemy models while the enemy models are within ten of the spellcaster. Which if she's a front uh, front fighter, you know, she's always on the front line, she will usually be within ten of most things, so yeah, giving everybody, and it's not just uh, just uh, warrior models, not just warjacks. Every every friendly faction model gains plus two to their attacks and damage rolls, including herself. So that gets her up to a you know a flames of fourteen and a you know punching fist of fifteen and a mat of nine. So yeah, even even her becomes like a a small miniature warjack who is very accurate at hitting things. So. 
yeah. So she got way more dangerous with certain spells, and even though she lost her wall of fire, which is always nice. And I imagine Ignite was the original spell that they had, and that got replaced with Insight, which is way better in my my opinion, just because it affects everybody. It just doesn't give everybody the critical fire effect. So that is what it is. But let's go on, move on to our next version. Fiora, Protector of the Flame. Fiora was both humbled and exalted by her travails during the Caspian Soul War, and most important conflict at the outset of the Great Crusade. Throughout the fighting, she rallied her followers in defense of the besieged city's sacred sites and led them on feats of uncommon bravery. She found, however, that before there could be victory, there must be sacrifice and change. During Signar's initial invasion into Seoul, there was a moment in which Fiora faced certain death. A confrontation with the Signaran warcaster Alistair Kane left her buried beneath the wreckage of her devout. Trapped and helpless, and surrounded by enemies, she experienced self full self-awareness and did not like everything she saw. She realized her drive and ambition, though necessary to transform an unready populace into a viable army and in the name of Meaneth, had distracted her from her true path, forging the Flame Guard into the greatest fighting force in the Protectorate and rising on their efforts to position where she could lead the Theocracy. She was also reminded that the original purpose of her order was to pr the protection of the great holy places of Meaneth, now threatened by the invading Signaran army. Well, that's not really, uh, sounds like she's self-fulfilling her own, her own demise there, because, yeah, <laughs> self-reflection's usually seeing your faults and be like, you know what, maybe I should change, but she's like, you know what, this means I should be the leader of my entire order. Yeah, that's what she got. I'm not saying she's crazy, but, uh, that seems a little bit egotistical, but we are talking about Fiora. With the clarity of purpose burning anew in her heart, Fiora managed to find her strength to escape the Warjack's impossible bulk, even as the Daughters of the Flame who had witnessed her fall rushed to her side. She insisted they take her to one of the beleaguered outer garrisons and gather the surviving Flame Guard. At the head of the ragged force, Fiora marched to the courtyard of the Great Temple of the Creator, where the Signarns pressed forward in a seemingly unstoppable advance. As she led her warriors into Signaran flanks, Fiora unleashed the full fury of flame, backed by renewed faith and pain, filling her warjacks with power and annihilating whole ranks masses of the enemy. The Signaran balked and were routed, and the temple was preserved. Only a months later, Fiora marched alongside Hierarch Voil into the heart of Caspi itself. The armies of the Lawgiver seemed unconquerable as they laid waste to the enemies in Signar's capital. In their moment of triumph, Fiora saw Lord Commander Stryker defeat Voil, and with him their seemingly assured victory. Grand Exemplar Krios withdrew the army in response, and Fiora reluctantly joined the retreat to Seoul. Fiora was shocked by Voil's death as he had been instrumental in her rise to power. That such a powerful man could be killed in the moment of his triumph was troubling. Fiora's ambition had taken the Hierarch's place seemed to be dashed when Severus, a man with little patience for disrespect and whom she had personally insulted, ascended to supremacy. Nevertheless, Fiora's ambition remained undimmed, and she set about consolidating her political influence in the southern garrisons, while the Hierarch focused on extending his crusade to the north. Her eyes remained fixed on Signar. The great enemy, she began to align the pieces by which she would gamble her future on proving to her army that she should rule supreme. Though some of these risks did not pay off, as she had hoped, nonetheless, she demonstrated her cunning, her boldness, and her utter fearlessness in the pursuit of her goals. The soldiers of the Temple Flame Guard still looked to her as the ultimate protector of the Temple, as embodiment by the Immortal Flame. So, yes, she almost had a, uh, she had a life or death experience there and became more egotistical and power hungry. Yeah, that's, I suppose some people don't go the humble route on this, I guess. Uh, but, yeah, let's see how much more dangerous she can get. Uh, let's read the uh, Mark 3 to Mark 4 changes. And, as always, let's start with the uh, stat line as usual. Uh, still a speed 6, still a mat of 7. However, her rat went from a 5 to a 6, which would make sense since she's running some flamethrowers in this edition. Uh, her arc is still a 6, and her 
Control range is still a 12, and she is still a 15 and 17 armor, as per last time. Uh, she still has immunity to fire, and she, of course, was given dual weapon, as all Warcasters in Mark IV have. Two abilities she has kept in this Mark IV is Caustic Presence, which any continuous fire effects of enemies in her control range, uh, control range no longer expire, so they can't roll any dice and have those expire. Um, and then she also has Righteous Flame, so any enemy models in either activation within two of her uh, suffer fire continuous effects. So she will light you on fire and she will keep you on fire. So that is awful. Let's go over her feet and see what we have changes there. And Wildfire doesn't look like it's changed at all. Fiora gains one focus point for each enemy currently in her control range who are suffering from fire continuous effect. Then can immediately hand that focus out to Warjax and her battle group uh, that are also in her control range. And then, on top of that, she can also remove fire continuous effect from any number of models in her control range and put that put those new fire continuous effect on other models, enemy models, currently within her control range. So she can just pick up fire and throw it around however she sees fit, and she gains magic power for it. So yeah, that's awful. And she likes to catch things on lots of fire as per her weapons. Um, looks like she's given a heavy flamethrower, um, a spray 10, a pow 12, and causes fire damage and fire continuous effect because it is a flamethrower. And then her new weapon, instead of her little punching fist, she was given a weapon called the Apocalypse. And the Apocalypse is a range 2 weapon, so it has reach. That's magical and it has the fire critical effect, but this guy is swinging on a POW 14, so he can knock out some pretty heavy fire damage as well. Well, fire continuous effect. It's not a fire damage weapon, it's just fire continuous effect. And let's go over her spell list, see what has changed there. Alrighty, looks like we still have a Cleansing Fire, and Cleansing Fire is her AoE. Um, cleansing fire causes fire damage, and on critical effect, models hit suffer fire continuous effect. It is a range 8, POW 14, uh, 8 AoE, um, 2. And as every particular Warcaster seems to at least have one fire spell, and she actually has a few more, so let's go over that. Um, looks like they replaced Ember Spark with Convection. So Ember Spark used to. Uh, a lot of the spellcaster gain an additional spell or additional die on the attacks attack rolls for that spell and if the model was not suffering from the fire continuous effect and it would cause the fire continuous effect that's been scrapped we now have convection convection anytime it destroys a living enemy model you can give a focus to a warjack in your battle group which is cool um and allows you to have a spell at least that you can kind of do damage and then give focus and then do more damage with the warjack later on um, then we have, uh, we still have Escort, and it says Cohort Models in the Spellcaster's Battle Group beginning their activation in the Spellcaster's Control Range gain plus two speed when advancing as part of their normal movement. And then the Spellcaster gains plus two arm while within, uh, while one or more Cohort Models are within three inches of her or them. And I just want to note, because I've seen this happen a few times, Cohort Models and your Spellcaster are not the same model. So cohort models would be any war beasts or war jacks in your group gain the plus two speed. Your spellcaster only gains the plus two armor. Just want to make that noted now because I've seen that confused where they think the spellcaster is getting plus two speed and plus two armor which would be awesome but that's not how the spell works. And let's move on. We still have the fire starter spell which is awesome, it's an upkeepable spell, it says target a model in the spellcaster's battle group and that model's melee and ranged weapons gain continuous fire, so another easy way to add fire to people and for this particular warcaster you want to add fire to a lot of people because her feet loves to have fire continuous effect out there and then she still has her fire step spell uh, enemy models currently within two of the spellcaster suffer a power at 13 damage fire or damage roll and then after the damage is resolved, I place the spellcaster two inches from its current location. It can be used only once per activation, so you're still hitting people with fire. And, well, we all know that Fiora loves her flames. And, yeah, outside of that, uh, besides that one spell being switched with Convection, I think she is pretty much the same caster. Well, she has a little bit better rat. 
So she's a little bit better at doing her ranged weapons, especially since she does have a flamethrower that causes continuous fire and it has a spray of 10. Yeah, having the extra rat does definitely help her spread around that flame, but I'm hoping that I do not have to go up against her in the future because I'm getting a little bit old. But let's move on and see what other changes she has had. Fiora the Conquering Flame Fiora has always been certain of her course, beholden to no one, and answering primarily to her own ambition. These qualities are remarkable in a society that so often crushes personal initiative and forces obedience. From the beginning, Fiora was destined for greatness. Her influence affirmed when she became the leader of the Incendium and the Temple Flame Guard. Her authority magnified by her status as a warcaster with an army at her beck and call. Her aspirations have always been higher to rule the theocracy. And the time has come when her flame may rise to the ultimate ascendancy. When Fiora went against the orders and led an invading army deep into Signar for the first time since the Caspia Soul War, there were those among the Scrutators who predicted the end of her aspirations. Her actions were in open defiance of the orders of the Hierarch, necessitated by the tenuous alliance she made with the former king of Signar, Vinter Rathorn IV. For Fiora, the die had been cast. She had seen the opportunity to demonstrate her resolve to the Great Crusade and a chance to force Signar to abandon its support of the Morrowin faith. Though Vinter ultimately failed and was defeated, Fiora felt no regret over the choices she had made. She believes Vinter's defeat could have been avoided if not for the ultimate interference of intercessor Krios, who confronted Fiora in the Battle of Farin. Speaking with the authority of the Hierarch, he ordered Fiora to withdraw. She felt compelled to obey in this instance. The alternative would have been a bloody feud between the Temple Flame Guard and the Knights Exemplar, a conflict that would have divided the armed might of the Protectorate and left them vulnerable to their enemies. When Fiora was subsequently brought before the Synod, she passionately argued the merits of her course with rhetoric that stirred the hearts of the gathered Viscos. Though they would not speak ill of the Hierarch, the majority of who witnessed Fiora's testimony were convinced. Her words revealed his choices as short-sighted and timid against the blazing glory of Fiora's lofty aspirations. The end result of the trial was not Fiora's punishment or disgrace, as, a, as the Scrutators predicted, but her emboldenment in the eyes of the soldiers, the clergy, and the commoners alike. Against such groundswell of support, the Scrutators were powerless to rebuke her. The majority of the Synod deemed her disobedience forgiven as an attempt to answer to the divine will of Meneth as she saw it, a duty every priest must obey. Fiora continues on her rising trajectory within the Protectorate. Since being absolved of her alleged crimes, she has taken the reins of the Southern Army like never before and has extended her participation in crusades abroad. Though she has considered support of in the Synod, there is no denying a strain exists between the priestess and the aging Hierarch Severus, whose authority was undermined by her actions. Some fear conflict is inevitable. With Severus nearing the end of his life, Fiora continues to solidify her place at the heart of the nation's dawning golden age. So, instead of her getting in trouble for taking the reins and taking her army into Signar, her, she was so passionate about it and so passionate that, you know, Mina told her to do it, that she is not being punished. That's not going to end badly at all. But we shall find out in the coming chapters of this. Um, but let's see what Mark 3 to Mark 4 changes she has. I'm doubting there's all that much, but we never know. Alrighty, and we'll of course talk about her stats first and get on through there. Uh, she is a mounted model in this particular version. I think most people are usually mounted in their third versions in War Machine, but this one's mounted. So her speed has jumped up to an 8. Her mat is still at a 7. Her rat is still at a 6, so from her original version of 5, it's at a 6 in Mark 4. Her defense is 14 and her armor is 18. And as a horse, she was given breakthrough because she's a cavalry model. She still has her immunity to fire, and she still has her a dual attack. So, still has all that, just a little bit better rat. And I appreciate that uh, that all horses have breakthrough. I'm not sure if they did in Mark III, but it's now a ability that every mounted model seems to have. 
But let's go over her special abilities. Alrighty, well, they removed Assault because Assault's not really a thing anymore. Um, because, well, with dual attack, Assault's kind of no longer needed. Uh, she still has Flaming Trail, which means if she advances into base-to-base -base contact with an enemy model, that model automatically suffers Fire Continuous Effect. Ouchie. And then she has Reposition, 3 inches. So, I imagine with those two moves, you could always light up two different models because after you do base to base contact one enemy and you have reposition you could walk into base to base contact with another enemy and cause flame on two or more models so that would be cool um let's go over her weapons and see what's changed there and as per normal nothing really changed there except her rat is better with her flamethrower uh, it's still a spray at 10, still a fire weapon with fire continuous effect, and a POW 12. Uh, and then her her melee weapon, Apocalypse, still a mat 7, range 2, magic weapon, and critical fire. So, pretty much all the same there. I believe the only thing we're missing is the mount attack. I'm not sure if that's just an oversight or they just took it off. I'm not entirely sure. They do have some weird stuff that happened. But let's go over her feet and see if anything changed there. And of course not. It Clash of Flames. Uh, Fiora immediately casts inside without spending focus. And additionally, while in Fiora's control range, friendly faction models gain her flame trail ability, so anybody they in base to base contact with automatically catch on fire as well. So that's awful. But let's see what Insight does. And making the assumption Insight is Insight is probably a a spell that is going to be pulled over from Mark 3 to Mark 4 and probably doing the same thing. So friendly faction models still gain a plus 2 to attack and damage rolls against enemy models that are within the spellcaster's command range. Although command is now a flat 10 inches so that is what we doing but that is a hefty a plus 2 to attack and plus 2 damage rolls and you're automatically catching your enemies on fire as well so that is awful. So let's see what else has changed. Or, not change, rather. So we still have a Banishing Ward, and it still does the same thing. Enemy upkeep spells and animize on target model slash unit are expired, so that's awesome. And we still have Fire Step, and everybody knows what Fire Step does. Enemy models currently within 2 inches of the Spellcaster suffer a power 13 fire damage roll, and then the Spellcaster can move 2 inches from her current location. Then looks like a spell we gained was Immolation. Immolation causes fire damage, and on a critical effect, Models hit suffer fire continuous effect because she is a protectorate and they figured she probably needs to have a fire damage roll. Uh, looks like one of the spells that that one replaced was she lost molten metal. Target Warjack suffers one point of fire damage to each column on its power or on its damage grid, which is especially for lower armored Warjacks or lower lower health warjacks is awful so I can understand why they remove that because yeah she can just keep doing that and knock out what 18 health without even having to roll one damage roll yeah I can understand why they remove that um, and then uh, she still has her red line which I always enjoyed red line I think red line is a fantastic spell uh, so what red line does is and they changed up the wording a little bit because we no longer have strength in Mark 4. We just have uh, attack damage rolls or melee attack damage rolls, so that's what they changed. But uh, target Warjack in the Spellcaster's battle group gains a plus two speed and can run, charge, and make slam or pa trample power attacks without spending focus. Additionally, affected models gain plus two to the melee damage rolls and collateral damage rolls. And then at the end of each of those activations, the Warjack suffers a D3 damage points. And yes, it's upkeepable, so if you want to keep you know, injuring your guys over and over again, if you have mechanics, this would be the time for them. But uh, yeah, it makes them way faster and do a lot more damage for melee guys. So yeah, she makes her people way more deadly and her ability just to catch everybody on fire, that is pretty you know, part of the course of her. And then uh, and her feet allows everybody else in her control range to do the same, so. Yeah, I look forward to seeing what her final rendition is. I wonder if she has another rising or if she's going to fall hard during the Infernals campaign, but we'll find out. All right, let's move on to her final rendition. And one of the few descriptions that we have from her looks like an inner monologue, which we'll be reading in my voice and not her voice because, well, I am not her. So she plotted and schemed for years, years. 
She was to be the next hierarch. She was to rule the protectorate. It was her destiny, or at least that's what Fiora thought. Then the Infernals came, and all these years of backstabbing and manipulation just went kapooey. While the world crumbles, her rage swells. With nothing left to control, she has but one purpose. One thing fueling her infinite well of hatred and spite. She's going to watch the world burn. And that she does, because this particular rendition, well, it's been modified a lot in Mark 4, but we're going to read what the changes were between Mark 4, or Mark 3 to Mark 4, and then we'll see. Uh, she was nerfed a little bit because her Mark 3 rendition of this was a little bit OP'd, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, we're going to start with, of course, her stat line. She is still a speed 6, um, still a magic attack of... Six, still an arc of six, although in the Mark III she can get up to a arc of eight, um, but I don't know if that's still in there. Um, and her control range is still a 12, and she still has a defense of 15 and 17 arm, so she's still a pretty dodgy at that point. Also, she still has her immunity to fire as well. Alrighty, and first let's go over the things that she got to keep in Mark IV. Uh, she still has Field Marshal, or for her special abilities, she still has Field Marshal Aggressive, so a War Jacks in her battle group can still run or charge without spending focus. She still has Resourcefulness, so upkeep spells that she has on models in her battle group, um, she can upkeep without spending a focus, so they just stay on, so that's kind of awesome. Especially for somebody that only has six focus, uh, you don't want to be burning off like that. And it appears she was given Hand of Vengeance. Uh, when one or more friendly faction warrior models are destroyed or removed from play by an enemy attack while within five of this model, she gains plus two to her melee attack and melee damage rolls. And what she lost was her Hatred and Spite. Now, Hatred and Spite is a pretty broken move and I can understand why they took it off. So, uh, in Mark Three, the Hatred during your maintenance phase, you place one Anger token on this model and this model gains one strength for each anger token on it. And additionally, once you get five or more anger tokens, she gets an additional plus two focus. Yeah, that's a little busted too, isn't it? Um, because that is basically getting her up to a plus five or more strength because there is no cutoff to this. So if a game goes longer than, say, five rounds, uh, you're going up against a lady who's hitting at 17s with seven focus, yeah, and that is pretty dang scary. Also, the spite move rolls into the hatred, so if an enemy model causes one or more of this model's upkeep spells to expire, that enemy model suffers one damage point for each anger token on this model and the fire continuous effect. So, can you imagine, you know, shutting down like with, was it Hex? I don't know, whatever it was that, whatever spell you could use to shut down upkeep spells and just take like a pal five or more. Yeah, or not a pal five, but just five damage or more on it. Yeah, and you're on fire. Yeah, it's a, it was a little bit broken during the time, but I can understand why they took it off and switched out with Hand of Vengeance, Hand of Vengeance because uh, that's a little bit simpler spell and requires a lot less uh, finagling there. But let's go over her feet and see if anything changed there. And survey says burnt out. No, it's actually the exact same thing. Uh, enemy models currently within three inches of one or more for Warjacks in her battle group uh, suffer an unboostable power 13 and they catch on fire. So if you're running her with a lot of Warjacks, uh, then uh, you can clear out a lot of low armored models and catch fire to everything else. So. And her weapon, Flame Saw, is still the same thing. Still has Critical Shred on it, so on a critical hit during this weapon's combat action after the attack is resolved, this model can make another attack with this weapon against that model. Uh, it's still a Mat 7, still a Power 12, still a Magical Weapon, and, and it still causes Continuous Fire. So, yeah, just as dangerous there, but let's go over her spell list, see what has changed. So, uh, some of the spells that she lost was Road to War. Um, which is a weirdly complicated spell anyway. Um, and then another one she lost is Scorn, um, because Scorn is connected to her little firebrand thing, or her little anger point token things that she had in Mark III, so that's been removed, of course. Um, but what she still has is she still has her Death March. Um, so 
target friendly faction unit gains plus two mat and vengeance. So if during their maintenance phase, if one or more models in that unit were damaged by an enemy, models in that each model in that unit can advance up to three and take a swing. Um, she still has fire starters, so target model in her uh, battle group gains uh, continuous fire on their weapon. Uh, she still has hell rot, so a target cohort in her battle group gains plus two arm and retaliation. Um, so, if they were damaged by a model uh, during their maintenance phase, they can advance up to three and take a swing. Uh, she was given Tantrum, which is awesome. Uh, tantrum is a spell for her. If one or more models in the spellcaster's battle group were damaged by an enemy attack while within five inches of the spellcaster, during your maintenance phase, you can move up three inches and take a swing. And then she was also given Firebrand. So, on a hit target model and the D3 nearest enemy models within three inches also suffer the fire continuous effect and this guy is a POW 14 range 10 spell so yeah this thing can knock out some heavy damage especially throwing a continuous fire of a POW 12 onto a low armored model probably gonna kill him off so um, I feel like she is a very good warjack a warjack carrier for this even though she has some stuff for just friendly faction units uh, which is cool. I feel like she is very, uh, very into her war jacks in this particular rendition of her just being angry that she could not steal the seat of power of the Protectorate. So, but still just as dangerous, and I do not look forward to seeing her on the field of battle. But let's move on to Krios. And we'll start with High Exemplar Krios. Though few are blessed enough to know Minot's will directly, the god mandates are set in stone and passed from one generation to the next by orders devoted to divine service. These groups have perfected the means to prepare the lawgiver's chosen followers for the wars of Cain. Michael Krios, a high exemplar of the Knight's Exemplar, is a prime example of Minot's worldly influence embodied by mortal man. Krios was born into a community of the old faith in the rugged north of Kodor. Bereft of his mother from birth, the young Michael aspired to become a paladin of the Order of the Wall to serve as a guardian of the people after debtors conscripted his father into forced labor. The elder Krios was overwhelmed with unrelenting work to reduce his debt while trying to raise his son alone. At last the hopes was given to his child a better life. He entrusted Michael to the care of a group of visiting Minite pilgrims who took the boy south to the Protectorate to provide him with proper upbringing surrounded by the faithful. Michael channeled his pain of separation from his family into the quest for perfection. So strong were his convictions that he sought to enter the priesthood. As an acolyte, he encountered a band of heathens robbing a sacred crypt. Enraged, Michael assailed them with no more than his fists and his faith. Cracking bones with his bare hands, the Kadorn born Minite seemed a wrathful, unstoppable giant as he towered over his quaking foes. After crushing these des desecrators, he prayed to Minath for direction at the adjoining temple. Michael Krios realized his destiny rested in neither the clergy nor the paladin he had admired as a youth. A visiting member of the Knights Exemplar overheard the acolyte at prayer and was impressed enough to invite Krios to join the Brotherhood. Exemplars say their initiation is their true birth, when old lives and families are put aside and Krios left his past behind to pursue his true calling. Michael Krios quickly rose in Minot's grace and in the opinion of the ruling Viscos. His efforts were effective in stamping out her heretics and blasphemers wherever they were rooted. Even before the Protectorate initiated its larger crusade, Krios dedicated himself to going where the wayward masses spurned Minot's law. Krios believes every man and woman lives as a gift of the Creator, and those who take Minot's for granted are unworthy of their flesh. He has sent many a dissenting soul into the arcane for judgment. High Exemplar Krios' concentration is unmatched as he directs interdictions of thousands of zealous soldiers and warjacks to key points in battle. So strong is his faith that the mere touch of his blessed weapon can revoke the unwholesomeness sorcery granted by lesser gods to their wayward followers. Among the people of the Protectorate, Krios has become a living legend, 
when the decision was made to renew war with Signar, thousands gathered to listen to him stir the faithful in preparation for battle. His flowing robes and thick, ruined inlaid armor enhance his pr impressive physique, while his unwavering faith makes him a leader upon whom the Scrutators can rely with absolute confidence. Yeah, and he hits hard too, because I uh, tell you, Kadorn born. Yeah, I just, anytime I hear Kaborn, uh, Kadorn born, forecasters, I think the butcher. And yeah, yeah, and he's just as tall, so. These guys can really throw around some hard damage if they need to. Although, Krios might be a little less crazy than the Butcher, or depending on how you see Zealots from the Protectorate, uh, a different type of crazy? That could be it. But let's read his Mark 3 to Mark 4 changes and see if anything actually changed. And it appears Krios has just gotten better in Mark 4 because the changes they gave him just make him way better. Uh, he's still a, we're going to go over stat line first, he is still a, a speed 5, so he's not super quick. Uh, he's still a mat 7, he still has a me melee warcaster, defense 14, armor 16, has, still has an arc of 7 because he is a very spellcasty spellcaster. Uh, he still has a control range of 14. And one of the abilities they gave him, personal abilities they gave him for Mark IV is Tactician. So while within 10 inches of this model, friendly models ignore other friendly models when determining line of sight, and then they can advance through other friendly models as if they were not there. If they have enough, if they have enough uh, speed to get through them completely, and so that's basically all he's got. That's all he needs. Uh, his weapon still has dispel on it, so he hits somebody with it. It's a model slash unit, and the upkeep spell or animi on that immediately expires. It is still a range two chain weapon at a POW 14, so it is still very painful to be hit by, and it is still a magical weapon as well. And it ignores shields because it is, of course, a chain weapon. His feet is still exactly the same. Enemy models currently within Krios control range become knocked down. That's it. Simple, effective, no complications. Just knocks everybody down. And then his spell list is pretty much identical. He still has Cleansing Fire, which still causes critical uh, continuous fire effects. It is still a range 8. It is still an AoE... Well, the AoE is changed in Mark IV, so it's AoE 2 inches, so... And it's a still a POW 4 slash 8. Um, so, I think the original AoE was 3, a three inch template, but the 2 kind of took over for that. Uh, next spell, Defender's Ward, still has Defender's Ward. Still gives a plus 2 defense and plus 2 armor to friendly faction model slash units. So, simple, effective, easy. Um, still has Immolation. Immolation causes fire damage and on a critical hit causes continuous fire. So, that's still the same. Uh, Lamentation. Uh, when a model casts a spell in the spellcaster control range, double the cost of the spell. Additionally, they have to pay double for upkeep. And that's the same from the original one as well. And it's still upkeepable. So, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I would want to turn that off as quickly as possible. And then he still has Purification. Continuous effects, animize, and upkeep spells in the spellcaster's control range immediately expire. So he is very anti-spellcaster, anti-upkeep spells, and yeah, anti animi So yeah, he is very simple in what he does and very effective at running large groups of protectorate zealots doing whatever they want to do. So. Yeah, I wouldn't want to go up against him. He's kind of a just super well-rounded caster, all in all. Uh, doesn't have super complicated spells that require you know very specific situations, and his feet just knocks everybody down. So you know, all he needs to do is get close to the front line where he needs to be, and, and he does he does mean its work. So let's move on to his next rendition. See what changed. See how he got better. See how he got worse. Grand Exemplar Krios. Michael Krios is a man of faith in few words who lives his life according to the strict code, the oath of the Knights Exemplar. Duty to the Creator and fealty to his priests on Cain have consumed him and burned away whatever imperfections once corrupted his mortal soul. No other man alive so perfectly exemplifies what it means to be a loyal warrior of the faith serving in Minot's name. When Grand Exemplar Banehurst gave his life to protect the Harbinger of Minot, 
against the Crixian despoilers, Hierarch Garrick Voyle did not hesitate to appoint Krios to the new leader of the Knights Exemplar. For ten days and ten nights, Krios remained in isolation at the sovereign temple of the One Faith, praying and purifying himself. Priests attend him, and he was set to trials that pushed his spirit and tugged at the very fabric of his soul. Scrutators watched him, measured his actions, and weighed his prayers. Finally satisfied to his, in his absolute commitment to his faith, the Scrutators released him to take on his new vows. Krios emerged from the temple wearing brilliant armor of gold and steel and holding aloft the shining spear, Justifier. Since that day, Krios has led the exemplars at the fore of the Great Crusade. He thrusted his legions through Signar's defenses like Justifier's spearing a piercing blade, leaving the swath of ash and cinder where infidel encampments once stood. The protectorate forces look to him as a guiding light of righteousness and the scribes of the true faith record each of his valorous deeds, keeping a careful tally of the dead he sends to the arcane. This grand exemplar is the enigma to the other leaders of the Protectorate. While he does his duty without hesitation, he is not above questioning the actions of the church. Krios is a courageous and fearsome warrior, but does not possess the ruthlessness common to the midnight hierarchy. This may, in fact, be one of his greatest strengths, and it has already made him a hero to the common people of the Protectorate. Krios joined others in mourning the loss of the great leader when the Hierarch Voil was killed, but ha he had little sympathy for the hubris and callous disregard displayed by the late Hierarch towards those who shared his faith. Yet he performs his duty and serves the position of Hierarch, regardless of the man who bears that title. He knows that sometimes duty is best carried out by asking questions no other would dare. Menites are often the instrument of their own contrition, and the exemplar Krios is no exception. He takes the weight of the crusade on his own shoulders, continually pushing himself to assure his success, even at the cost of countless sleepless nights of prayer and contemplative vigils. Over the years, many friends have bled out their last under his command, and he has always been grateful for their sacrifice. All Menites, and especially the Knights Exemplar, are his brothers in battle, and he is determined to avenge the fallen and the lost. With every death stoking the warrior's furnace within him, his rage and fury have become the spear and shield of the Menites' vengeance. Yeah, so he got a little bit scarier, actually. Just when you thought he couldn't, you know, do any more damage, he just you know, takes it up to 11 in this version. And you see a lot of his uh, ideologies with the Paladins of the Order of the Wall and protecting the average Minite from, you know, the ruthlessness of the, of the hierarchy that is in the Protectorate. So he wants to try to save as many people as he can rather than just burn them off as if they're just fuel. So that is one of his more endearing factors with his, with his people, and that's why they see him as a hero. But let's read over his Mark 3 to Mark 4 changes and see how they are going. And as always, let's start with this stat line. He's still a speed 5. Still, uh, his mat went up to an 8. Um, so that's actually a little bit better than his original, original setup. This makes him a lot more of a uh, melee player on that one. Uh, his defense is still a 14. Arm is still 17. And he is still tough. So... Not much has changed there. And his personal abilities are still there. He still has imperishable convictions. So when a friendly faction model is destroyed while within his control range, he can remove one damage point from himself. So he can actually, <laughs> if they're trying to take him out, uh, he can just keep regaining his health based on that. And then he still has Paragon of Faith. So while within 10 of this guy, all friendly exemplar warrior models gain tough so yeah he makes them even more annoying to try to take out low armor guys than they were before but let's check out his weapon it being a very interesting thing that he has so justifier is a range 2 pow 14 magical weapon and some of the nice things he has on it are life trader so when he attacks and the attack makes a hit he can choose to suffer one damage point to make an additional die of damage onto that. So if he's charging, he can get that thing up to a pow or to a pow 14 with four dice of damage whirl by taking one damage. So 
yeah, that's pretty scary. And a guy with Matt 8, he's going to be taking, uh, he's going to be hitting most things without too much of a problem. Also, he has the special attack of Slam or Smite on it. So the model hit is Slam D6 directly away from it. And then if the model, if the model it hit has a larger base than the attacking, then the roll distance is halved. So, and collateral, da collateral damage is the same as his weapon, so it is still a POW 14. So, that's a very dangerous weapon to be hit by, and him as his Warcaster is a very dangerous guy to go up against in melee anyway. Let's check out his feet and see if anything changed there. As per usual, no, it's still the same feat that it was before. Strength of Arms, and this is like his original feat that knocks everybody down, but instead of knocking them down, which is would be easier for range attacks, uh, he just allows friendly faction models, if they're making a melee attack against an enemy that's in his control range, the attack automatically hits, so they don't even have to roll a attack roll. So unless they do to try to get a try to get a crit effect, but that's just a more of a messy meta type of situation. And then not only on top of them automatically hitting, they can make an additional melee attack during their combat actions. So yeah, if they're already hitting real hard, they're gonna hit hard twice. So, yeah, just as dangerous as it was before, but let's check out his spell list and see if anything changed there. Alright, it appears we lost two spells on here. We lost his battle charge. Um, but this was giving creatures counter charge, and since Privateer Press is trying to remove out of activation, or out of turn moves, like counter charge, that's one of the things that just kind of went away. And then Castigate has been removed. Um, so enemy models can't channel spells or be forced to cast Animus as well in the Spellcaster's control range. I imagine that seems a little bit broken, so I I can imagine why they took that out. Uh, but what we did get on his spell list is we got a sail, so a target friendly faction Warjack can charge or slam without making without spending focus, and they gain plus two speed, and models slammed by them are moved an additional two inches, so that's good. Uh, we still have Chasen. Uh, so enemy upkeep spells and animize on target model slash unit to expire. So, and that is an offensive spell, so you don't want to be shooting that at your own guys, because you can't. And it's a power 12 spell, so you can start removing things off your enemies before you cast your feet, so they don't get their armor buff when you hit them twice. And then we still have cleansing fire. Cleansing fire causes fire damage, and on a critical effect, or on a critical hit, it causes continuous fire. I think that is a pretty normal spell for the protectorate. Uh, it's still an AoE 2, still a POW 14 slash 8, and then we still have Inviable invo Resolve. So target friendly model slash unit gains plus 2 arm and can't be knocked down or pushed or slammed. So always a good spell to have, especially for lower armor guys or higher armor guys just to watch your enemy you know, sizzle around that. Uh, we still have Sacrosanct, which is a pretty nice spell. So when an enemy non-leader warrior model destroys one or more friendly faction models in the spellcaster's control range with an attack immediately after the attack is resolved, the attacking model becomes knocked down. And that's a cool spell because it's his entire control range and it's not just one. So anybody who attacks him after their attack is resolved, they get knocked down automatically. So that's always a useful for a... Uh, for guys that are really good at dishing out lots of damage and catching people on fire when they're knocked down is even easier. So yeah, outside of him losing those two spells, uh, that two slightly broken spells or out of turn spells are uh, you know to be seen in Mark IV but not really going to stop him in the long run. So he is still just as dangerous. But let's go over to his final uh, horse riding section and see how much stronger he has gotten because Morrow knows he has gotten faster. Intercessor Creos. There is no greater honor among the faithful than to take part in the great crusade. And there is no mightier crusade crusader than Michael Creos. The grand exemplar he led his order to retake Seoul and then bolster the Northern Crusade. As intercessor he now leads the greatest army of the faithful ever gathered in a single force, or single cause. After the death of Hierarch Voil, Creos answered Severus' call to lead the Northern Crusade. 
His unyielding resolve and compassion with which he carries out his duties has made him a popular figure even among or even beyond his brother knights. Common menites and soldiers also revere him. More importantly, Creo's sense of honor has never interfered with his loyalty to the priests of Minas. Hierarch Severus looks upon the crusading knight as an essential pillar of his rule. After the Grand Exemplar's return to Laren from the defenses of the Menite Temple in Lael, Hierarch Severus gathered the Northern Crusade to witness Creos's elevation to intercessor. The ancient title has gone unused for many centuries, but demonstrates Severus' implicit trust in Creos. He can now act and fight on the Hierarch's behalf. Upon Severus's eventual demise, Creos is tasked with maintaining the stability of the Protectorate by preventing the martial orders from turning on one another at the behest of ambitious leaders. He also must ensure that the Great Crusade continues and that the theocracy and its army remain unified at any cost. Krios did not rest upon the promotion, but immediately marched his army into the field alongside Severus to confront enemies of the Protectorate. He played the instrumental role in guiding the Northern Crusade through the Cadoran held lands and then joined Hierarch Severus in his unusual temporary alliance with the Umbrian Vladimir Tepesky against Crix in the Thornwood. Were it not for the zeal and faith of the knights like Krios, darkness might have swallowed this portion of the mainland. Instead, the Crixians were driven from the region, their immortal masters toppled by mortal flesh and blood. Even with his unrivaled tactical brilliance, Krios prefers to lead his men personally and still conducts cavalry actions from atop his great steed, Agon, along with a hand-picked vanguard of exemplar Avenger brothers. At the onset of the battle, he determines the most critical point in the battle and rides to confront the faithless there, crushing lesser warriors beneath Agon's hooves as he advances. Bearing his spear conviction, intercessor Krios acts as Minot's rightful judgment made manifest upon the world. Yeah, so, so he is ba so Severus basically made him the follow up in case anything happens to him, which I can imagine why Fiora was so mad, especially during the uh, during the Infernal's crisis going on, because the person that held Protectorate and was told that you know Protectorate were his to hold together was Krios. So, yeah, I can imagine why she was pretty pretty angry about that, but. He is on a horse, way more deadly, way, way faster than he was before, because at a five speed you can kind of be quick, but not nearly as quick as you can be on a horse. But let's read his Mark III to Mark IV changes and see if he's gotten a better, worse, or kind of the same. And as always, we will start with his stat line, because, well, that's probably much what he does. Uh, his speed jumped all the way up to an 8. His mat is still an 8. Defense is still a 14. Arm still a... 18 arc still a 7 and control is still a 14 uh, he was given breakthrough like most horses in mark 4 have breakthrough and he is a cavalry model so he gets some uh, fun benefits from that including cavalry charge which gives you an additional uh, attack die when you're charging somebody from your horse so that is awesome uh, his abilities uh, he still has divine inspiration so this model gains an additional die on his attack and melee damage rolls and you discard the lowest die which is awesome. Um, he has leadership exemplar vergers, so while our vengers, sorry, while within ten inches of this model, friendly exemplar models also gain divine inspiration, so they also get an additional die on their attack and damage rolls and clear out the lowest ones. And then as a horse, he is given, or as a cavalry model, he is given reposition three. So after a, after a, not a run. Or he did not run or fail a charge, he can move up to three inches and reposition himself in a little bit better spot. So, yeah, he makes horses, or he makes their horses way, way more deadlier with that and way more accurate, and they can really dish out some damage. But let's, uh, let's check out his weapon, Conviction. Conviction is still a mat 8, range 2, power 14, magical weapon with blessed. So, with blessed, they remove any armor or defense buffs caused by a spell or an animus, which is awesome. Uh, and then he has brutal charge on that as well, so he gains a plus 2 to his charge damage roll. So, he is charging with a 16, which is crazy high, especially being that, you know, he gains an additional die on his attack and damage rolls with that anyway. And then his feat, Invocation of the True Law, enemy upkeep spells and animize in his control range immediately expire. 
and then Krios can immediately cast each of his upkeep spells without spending focus. Which, let's go check out his spell list and see what he has kept. I'm assuming probably everything, because, well, that's usually how it goes. Alright, first upkeep spell, he has Arcane Ward, and he kept that. Uh, so target friendly faction slash unit gain plus two defense and cannot be targeted by enemy attacks. Uh, looks like he kept a sail as his next upkeep spell. So target friendly faction Warjack can charge or slam without spending focus and they gain a plus two speed and a plus two to the slam distance that they clock them. And then looks like he kept crevice. That is not an upkeep spell. That is just a normal damage spell. But if crevice boxes its original target, it makes a spray six from that target from that target being the point of origin, and it's a POW 12, and models that are boxed by crevice are removed from play, so they can't be you know brought back. So that is nice. Uh, next upkeep spell we have death sentence still on there. When a friendly faction model misses target enemy model slash unit with an attack, they can reroll that attack, and each attack can only be rerolled once per that spell. And it's also an upkeepable spell. It's a range eight, so hit that hit that on a particularly feisty or dodgy group of enemies, and that will uh, allow you guys to hit them a little bit easier. And then he still has force hammer. Force hammer is not an upkeepable spell. It is just one of his damage doing spells. Instead of suffering normal damage rule, a uh, a non-incorporeal model hit by force hammer is slammed d6 inches away, and a pow 12. And then the collateral damage is a pound 12 as well, so that is awesome. And then he still has Ignite, so target friendly faction model gains plus two to their melee attack damage rolls. And they get critical fire on their stuff, and that is his last upkeepable spell. So he has, I'm just going to go over it, he has one, two, three, four upkeepable spells, all costing two. So literally he can pull himself out eight focus without needing to spend anything to, to kick all these guys out and make his army even more dangerous in the following turn after he pops his feet. So yeah, he is just as dangerous as he was and I didn't really see anything that has changed on him. He is just as great as he was before, just as fast, although him getting the, uh, him getting the breakthrough ability being a horse allows him to get into places that the enemies would prefer him not to be able to get into. So, but that will do it. That is Intercessor Krios, and that is the fullness of both Fiora and Krios's, uh and all their variations and such. Um, thank you guys so much. If you are still around, still listening, we appreciate you, you know, taking the time to check out all of this fantastic lore. And if you are enjoying it, please like, subscribe, let us know how you are enjoying it, tell us any stories comment please it does help and uh, let your friends and fellow gamers know to keep this big old steam train rolling and as always thank you private to your press for letting us read your fantastic lore and as always class dismissed